Hi, my name is Jack Wiest. I'm a senior principal engineer at Intel and the vice president of automated vehicle standards at Mobileye. Uh, and in this talk, we're going to talk about safety uh, and specifically a unique Mobileye technology called responsibility sensitive safety. So the first thing I'd like us to observe is that the, the act of driving is inherently risky. Uh, in this video, we see a number of vehicles highlighted in red that aren't always obeying the traffic rules. They're making aggressive maneuvers. Um, but the point is, you know, as human drivers, we have to do this. If we don't make these kinds of maneuvers, we're never going to get to our destination. And so the point here, the act of driving is inherently risky. The safest human driver in the world would be the one that never drives. And so would the safest automated vehicle. So our challenge is, how do we set the right balance between driving safely and still having a useful vehicle in the real world that can navigate some of these difficult but very common everyday scenarios. So let's take a look at how different players in the industry have typically talked about or tried to define what it means for an automated vehicle to drive safely. One of the most common approaches is a statistical argument, and that's where we hear things like miles driven, where we say, you know, I've driven millions or billions of miles. Well, here's two different environments. You know, a vehicle that drove a trillion miles over here doesn't mean that it's going to be safe driving a single mile over here. And so the point is, miles driven is a very difficult metric uh, to understand. It's hard to know if the miles were meaningful. It's hard to compare different mileage claims from different players. Um, and finally, if you were to make a change in your code, really, you should start back at zero. Because how do you know you haven't made a change that now means a mile that was previously driven safe is no longer safe? Another common statistic that we hear is disengagements, where the idea is the lower the number of disengagements somehow means something for the safety of the automated vehicle. Well, here's the magic roundabout in Swindon, uh, United Kingdom, and I know if I'm trying to avoid a lot of disengagements, I'm not going to drive in this kind of area. But that's not what we want, right? Automated vehicles are going to have to be able to navigate the most complex environments that exist in the human world uh, because that's where we want the vehicles to go. The other argument that we hear about sometimes is that I know what we'll do. We'll just take the rules of the road and digitize them so a machine can perfectly uh, obey them. Um, so the problem with this is there's a lot of scenarios where strictly following the rules of the road would still lead to a crash. So here's an example where we've got a stop sign here and the automated vehicle is going to be coming from the left. In this case, what we see is some human driver blew through that stop sign. And in this case, the automated vehicle stopped. But per the rules of the road, the automated vehicle had the right of way. So it could have crashed into that vehicle and said, well, I had right of way. That was the rule of the road. This person violated the rule of the road. But do we want that? Do we want automated vehicles crashing into other objects just because they can? Just because the rules of the road said that they were in the right? Uh, certainly not. So this approach doesn't work either. And then finally, we often get ethical arguments where we have noble safety goals, things like avoid collisions at all costs. Well, here's an everyday driving scenario. Let's say the automated vehicle is in the middle here. Uh, even as a human driver, I would ask you, if you're this middle vehicle, is there anything you could do to avoid an accident if another human driver was intent on crashing into you? Of course not, right? So for an automated vehicle, if an automated vehicle must avoid collisions at all costs, the automated vehicle can never drive in the middle lane on a three lane road. So again, we might have a safer vehicle, because right? it's not exposed to this kind of accident scenario, but it's certainly not very useful. So what do we do? How do we define driving safely for an automated vehicle? And so for a moment, we decided to think about what do humans do? Because when humans are driving well, and they're paying attention, they're not drunk, and they're not on their devices, or they're not tired or sleeping, we're often quite good drivers. So what is it that we do that enables us to be good drivers in those best of situations? It's made up of two parts. The first is explicit traffic rules. These are the things that are easy to understand. Speed limits, traffic li uh, signs, double yellow lines, things like this. These are fairly easy to understand. Uh, they can be easily uh, be made explicit and machine interpretable. But as we said before, if it was just as easy as following the explicit rules of the road, then we'd be done, right? But we're not. And that's the problem, is that we humans have an additional set of traffic rules 
that are implicit. These are hidden rules that aren't often written down that say things like uh, keep a safe distance. Well, what's a safe distance? Drive cautiously. What does cautious mean? How do I know if I'm a machine, if I'm driving cautiously or not? The challenge is these are behavioral characteristics that are often cultural because what it means to drive safely in China might mean something very different than to drive safely uh, in the United States. Or even within Europe, driving safely in Italy might mean something different than driving safely in Germany. And so these implicit traffic rules uh, are not only the secret to what allows us to drive safely and negotiate with other human agents, but they're culturally dependent and they're not often written down. So our challenge is, how can we take these implicit traffic rules and formalize these in a way so that a machine uh, can perform them in a way that is culturally sensitive to the human drivers uh, in which it's driving around. And so that's what we have done. Our safety model called Responsibility Sensitive Safety is an open, transparent, technology neutral model for autonomous driving. Uh, it provides a check on the functions inside the vehicle in terms of the artificial intelligence algorithms that are generating driving commands to make sure that those commands are always safe. Um, and in addition, it can be used externally to the vehicle as a technology neutral performance benchmark so that governments and other entities can have a metric to use to understand is that vehicle driving safely or not? Meaning, does that vehicle perform to the mathematical model that we have defined or not? If it does, give it a driver's license and put it on the road. If it doesn't, you know, maybe they need to take the test again, just like us humans. So let's watch a short video uh, that describes a bit about how this model works. Everyone agrees that autonomous vehicles are the future of mobility. But how can we be assured of their safety? Although we don't consciously think about it, humans follow a few basic principles to help us drive safely. For example, always maintain a sufficient distance from the vehicle ahead of you, or the right of way is given and not taken. However, these principles are subjective and open to interpretation. To provide true safety assurance for autonomous vehicle decision making, we must first clearly define those principles. Only then will we be able to program an autonomous vehicle that will be smart enough to negotiate the road alongside unpredictable human drivers. In order to formalize human common sense, Mobileye has developed the Responsibility Sensitive Safety Model. RSS is an open and transparent model that uses mathematical formulas for safe decision making by defining what constitutes a dangerous situation, what caused it, and the proper response to the dangerous situation. By doing so, we can ensure that the autonomous vehicle will not initiate a dangerous situation and also ensure that it responds appropriately when a dangerous situation is forced upon it by others. For example, while merging into traffic, the autonomous vehicles will cut in only with a minimal safe distance as defined by RSS. RSS builds upon these simple definitions of a dangerous situation by incorporating more complicated scenarios, such as junctions, limited sensing scenarios, and even unstructured roads. This allows us to gain full coverage of all possible scenarios in a multi-agent environment and clarify responsibility for collisions involving automated vehicles in the real world. These are just a few examples of how RSS is designed to mimic human judgment using mathematical definitions. At Mobileye, we believe that the challenge of providing verifiable safety assurance of automated vehicles is one the entire ecosystem must solve together. Therefore, we invite industry players and regulators to engage with RSS as a starting point for finding a true safety guarantee for autonomous vehicles. Join us in our journey to make safe autonomous driving a reality. Mobileye. All right, so as we saw, uh, RSS is made up of mathematical formulas and logical rules. Uh, these are the five rules that we have proposed in the safety model. And as a human driver, these should look familiar. 
When we're taking our driving test, of course the adjudicator is looking to make sure we're following the speed limit, obeying traffic lights, things like that. But really what they're looking for are these kinds of principles. Are we showing behavioral characteristics that are universal in their nature? so that after just a 30 minute driving test, they're confident enough to give us a license. Things like, are we maintaining a safe following distance so that we won't hit someone from behind? How are we cutting in or merging? Are we doing so in a safe manner or are we doing so recklessly? Are we being sensitive to right of way? Are we being cautious where there might be pedestrians or other agents occluded um, because we have limited visibility? These are the kinds of things, that these implicit traffic rules, which we have formalized in this safety model in a way that's machine interpretable and adjustable for different cultural sensitivities on what driving safely means. So, uh, to review, our assess is made up of three parts. The first thing we do is formalize safe driving, which by its basic foundation is a safe distance around the vehicle. And again, as a human, what are we doing when we're driving? Whether we realize it or not, we're maintaining a bubble around the vehicle, and we're trying to maintain that safety bubble or that safety envelope. When someone cuts us off, what do we do? We try to restore that safe bubble. So we've introduced that same concept to the machine. With that safe distance defined then, we can formally identify what constitutes a dangerous situation and that's the point at which we need to perform a proper response. And the proper response then restores the safe state around the vehicle. So these three basic concepts used in any environment, any kind of roadway, urban, rural, highway, whatever, are generic universal principles for safe driving defined by the model. So let's take a click down uh, at the first uh, element of what makes a safe state. So first and foremost, it's about a safe longitudinal and lateral distance from others. So let's look specifically at longitudinal. And here the basic question is the following. If we're the car in the rear, if the front vehicle were to suddenly slam on its brakes, the question is, how much distance do I need to be maintaining so to ensure that the automated vehicle can stop uh, before hitting the vehicle in front? And so what we can do um, is we can formalize this. At the end of the day, this is physics. We have objects of mass in motion, but we have unique parameters like the reaction time. How long does it take for the machine to be able to respond to changes in its environment? So we include all of these parameters um, into a formula. And here we are, and now we have a calculation of what is the minimum distance that the vehicle needs to maintain so that it has enough space and time uh, to be able to stop if the vehicle that we're following were to suddenly stop. So we've made explicit in a mathematical formula uh, something for a machine to understand what does a safe following distance look like. So with that safe distance, now we can identify explicitly what is the danger threshold. The danger threshold is that moment in time just before my safe distance is going to be compromised. And so that's the point at which we want to make sure to prepare to perform a proper response. So in long form, it looks like this. So when our safe distance was compromised, our vehicle braked to restore a safe distance, just as you would expect. So you might ask, does it work? And we are happy to say with confidence, it does. Um, so what you're gonna see here is a short video of one of our test vehicles driving here in Israel. Um, just simply trying to get from one end of the street to the other. So there's no complex navigation, we're not doing roundabouts, we're not doing exits and merging or anything like that. We're just on a straight road trying to get from one end of the street to the other, applying these behavioral characteristics, applying the RSS principles to our attempt to get from one end of that road to the other. So as we look at this road here, um, we see some kids up here at the front that are crossing the road. They're running across the road. As they're doing that, we're seeing other vehicles go around us because they're getting annoyed because we're slowing down because obviously we have a pedestrian. Our car is trying to nudge over and get space. By doing so, it's testing the limits of our safe distance. Oh, and once we get into a potentially dangerous situation, we turn back. So what are we doing? We're negotiating with other agents. Finally, the kid runs across the road at the last minute and we're successfully able to navigate around the parked car, even in the, in the driving path. So a very short distance, but a chaotic environment where this vehicle was able to successfully and safely navigate the road and negotiate with other human drivers and human pedestrians by doing nothing more than just applying the principles of our safety model. 
So uh, as we've demonstrated, RSS can be used in the vehicle. We are also working with global standards organizations to standardize this technology uh, for the benefit of the industry. And then finally, this can be used in regulation as a performance, uh, as a technology neutral performance benchmark so that governments and regulators have a common way to assess the performance of vehicles from any manufacturer. Uh, and in particular, on the notice of uh, the, the point about regulation, the, uh, the opportunity that we have with this model and the ability to set parameters that define that balance between safety and utility, we have a unique opportunity for the first time ever to define in advance that balance between safety and utility and efficiency of these vehicles in a way that is culturally representative of the way that we would like these vehicles to operate in the communities and cities in which we live. There's more to safety than just math. So let's take a look at a short video to illustrate what we mean. So let's talk about safety for a moment. If we take a step back and think about it, there's really two different kinds of safety. What we've been talking about so far is a technical solution to deliver a safe driverless vehicle. And so we can consider that sort of the life and death safety, right? Where autonomous vehicles should not be creating accidents and should not be crashing into other things and other people. And RSS is the way where we can make sure that that doesn't happen. But at the same time, psychological safety is actually equally important. If the passengers of our vehicle don't trust the vehicle, if they don't feel comfortable riding in the vehicle, then they're not going to want to use our service or trust our technology. And so in a sense, a psychological sense of safety, which is needed for the successful deployment of these vehicles, is based on human trust. But when we think about trust, we have a problem. There's a lot of statistics and surveys that say that, for example, 75% of US drivers report feeling afraid to ride in a self-driving car, right? So we have this trust issue. There's a perception that this technology is uncomfortable, that I'm not sure how it works, and I'm not sure if I can trust in it. And if we think a little bit deeper about why, you know, what do we mean by trust? Here's a dictionary definition of trust. It's a firm belief in the character, strength, or truth of something or someone. So those aren't words that we would typically attribute to a machine, but ultimately that's what we're asking these passengers to do, is to trust this machine with their lives. And so, uh, to better understand this, uh, we, conduct, we conducted a very unique study where we took participants from off the street, uh, from all different walks of life, we put them into an autonomous vehicle, uh, and we had them perform an entire journey well, they had a cell phone with an app, they ordered the ride, the vehicle picked them up, there was a route change during the ride, took them to their destination, and then they exited the vehicle. So the entire round trip experience of ordering and enjoying a robo-taxi. And we did this because we wanted to understand where do we have trust issues, right? Where do we need to work harder to explain or convey information about how the, how the vehicle works or how the technology works? so that we can design an experience then that can facilitate or establish that trust with our passengers. So in this study, uh, we uncovered seven contradictions, seven points of psychological tension in our test subjects uh, where they were having trouble sort of balancing this contradiction be maybe between what, they, between what they were feeling and what they logically knew. So for example, human judgment versus machine judgment. We all think we're excellent drivers, and so it's hard to think that some machine could be a better driver than me. 
Um, but at the same time, logically, I know that that machine is not going to be tired, They're not going to be distracted by their phone or other objects on the side of the road. And so, yeah, it probably should be a better driver than me, but I have trouble sort of handing over that, that control. Another example, make me aware versus unburden me from being aware. Here we were exploring how much information to make available to the passengers. Uh, the initial passenger feedback was show me as much information as possible because I want to see what the vehicle is seeing because I'm just really not sure about this technology. But very, very quickly we found that they quickly became overloaded with information and it was too much. Uh, and so they were burdened with too much information. So there's this balance between needing to be aware of what it's doing and why, but not so much so that it's distracting or actually is contributing to my anxiety because I'm seeing too much information to be able to process. And then finally one more, how it works versus proof it works. This is uh, an example of where consumers are just not familiar with this technology and how it works. And so we need to find ways to effectively communicate and explain what are the safety technologies inside the vehicle and show me that they're working during the ride. And so uh, with, this re with these research insights, um, we rolled all this information in to a brand new conceptual experience uh, for a future uh, in vehicle passenger experience. And the goal of this experience is to bridge the gap between technical and psychological safety. So let's take a look at a short uh, video uh, that illustrates how some of these concepts work with the goal of establishing trust between that human and the machine so that the passenger can sit back, relax, enjoy the ride, and not worry about their safety. So let's take a look at three elements that you saw in that video. The first was, as we talked about, how it works versus prove it works. The user experience contains a toolbox where it illustrates the safety features that are working inside the vehicle. And so you can actively see, for example, the distance, that minimum distance calculation that the vehicle is calculating to the vehicle uh, that it's following. The second area of tension around human judgment versus system judgment. Here where you see an illustration of the vehicle showing kind of the safety ring, right? That safety envelope defined by RSS. And because there's a pedestrian here, that ring is turning red, right? And you're seeing that reflected on the other vehicles. And so this is an unobtrusive way for us to illustrate and show that the vehicle is paying attention. It does see that pedestrian and it is going to do something about it, so don't worry. And then finally, because you're hopefully enjoying a book, reading the newspaper, on your phone, taking a nap, but you might feel that inertial movement of the vehicle suddenly stopping. And so in that sense, what you saw in the video is a glanceable replay feature where we show up here in the corner a replay of what happened. Why did the automated vehicle just do what it did? Oh, okay, in this situation, there was a pedestrian, we had a dangerous situation, so the vehicle performed the proper response. That's why they felt the inertial movement. Good, let's go back to you know, enjoying your book or, or taking a nap.
So these three concepts illustrate how we're taking that research from these user studies and embodying those into a, a novel in-vehicle experience that's linked with our safety model uh, to provide both technical trust as well as psychological trust. So in summary, we are leading the discussion around automated vehicle safety. We're engaged across industry with customers, competitors, and consortia to have an honest conversation about what does safety mean for an automated vehicle. We're doing research around the world to understand cultural differences of driving in countries like China compared to the US. Uh, and then finally, uh, we're engaged with governments to help them understand how our model works and testing the technology in our own vehicles in the real world here in Israel and soon countries elsewhere around the world.